Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. A couple weeks ago, Ben and I did a 2023 recap with a uh, webinar with Rishi, right? The best charts of 2023, correct? The best charts of 2023. I did. I'm in the midst of wrapping up my 2023 prediction recap. I went five wins, five losses, a one tie, which I feel pretty good about considering that I'm literally guessing. It's not bad. Uh, and in preparing for the recap and using uh, data, Y charts the whole time. It was, y, it was a lot of Y charts last night as I was working through this post. So I use it for everything. Fundamental data. Every day I'm on it. I mean, everything. Economic data. If you are a new customer, want to kick the tires on Y charts and save 20%, Tom Animal Spirits sent you and you got 20% off. Yeah. And also, we have a link in the show notes too. They did a blog re recap of our webinar. There we go. Find it there. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Am I, ben, am I looking puffy to you? I feel like, I feel like Not, this is the first time I'm looking at the camera and I notice some weight gain. Are you eating a lot for the holidays? I've been, I've been, uh, truly, my behavior is deplorable in terms of what I'm putting in my body. Okay. I feel like I it's catch, most catching people. up to me. Okay. I think that's most people in the holidays. Um, how was, no how more are your puffy holidays? than usual. How, more what? No more puffy than usual. Okay, I'll take it. How was, uh, how was your Christmas? We are recording the day after Christmas. The show must go on at Animal Spirits. Christmas was Christmas was great. It was fun. Kids opened gifts. It was 50 degrees here, so we were playing outside with all of them. I was a never... One of my parent principles was ne no... What do you call it? Battery-powered or electric-powered cars for the kids. You know the, 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 the Jeeps and stuff that kids can drive around in, the Barbie cars, whatever? I was always a no. We're never doing that. If you were going to be outside and moving, you're going to be using your legs. That's just me. I, I'm not judging other parents, but that's just me. But my wife, my son really wanted this roll car thing that had a battery. Roll I thought it was just, car thing? Roll car roll, thing? Roll play? I don't know it's roll, what it's called. It, anyway, it's, it's electric and you bat, battery powered. Wait, why did you just say roll car play? What does that mean? That's, it's called, I, I can't remember the name. It's called like <laughs> roll, roll something. Okay. And we got him one, and he was on it all day yesterday, out of, out of our hair, so now I'm, I'm a fan. Sunglasses on, cruising? Went against, went against my principles. You but, know, those things, yeah. those things were for rich kids growing up. I don't know That's how much they cost. That's what I thought, yes. Now, now everyone like, has them. We got one a couple of years ago for Kobe. I'm pretty sure it was like 150 bucks. Oh, was that it? Yeah. Massively, I was, I was, massively deflationary. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, the cost for me. It was, it was more the principle of the matter, but I, I caved. And okay. I'm glad I did. Ben, I saw, I saw a tweet that you did. You're still cooking. And you had a tweet that, that brought me back when Twitter used to be fun. Just a couple of people making jokes, having a good time. I try to keep it light still. Not, try, not, not cynical, not trying to embarrass one another, just having fun. So you tweeted a picture of... Matt Damon, the scene in the bar in Goodwill Hunting. If, and if you're not familiar with that scene, shame on you. And the tweet is this. Of course it's your contention. It's your first Christmas on Twitter. First you're going to start an argument about whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Then you're going to be poking holes in the Home Alone plot. Next, you're going to be regurgitating theories on Mr. McAllister's job. Really just chef's kiss. Credit to you. Did you chuckle as you typed that? I, I was pretty proud of myself for that. But <laughs> I was Because we have the same arguments every year, but there's always people who come in and think that it's original to have a diehard argument or Home Alone. You know, we've moved so far down the rabbit hole, people are now looking at, like, the basket of goods for Home Alone as opposed to the, the original arguments. So, uh, yes, we, we've had all these arguments before is what I'm saying. A basket? Oh, my gosh. Every year right? we find, we find uh, ways to go deeper and I deeper saw down a, the hole. I saw a comparison of the things Kevin bought at the store what were, in the grocery store. What were they worth? How much did they cost then versus what they cost now? Like, using CPI basket. Yeah. Uh. Which is, I don't know. These are the things we, we argue. You know, I, days. we were watching Home Alone 2. Um, I went into the plaza only recently for the first time. I went. My Chris kids asked I, me if I've ever been there before, and I don't know where it is. It's, it's right, uh, it's right by the park on Fifth Avenue by the Giant Apple Store. I think it's like 59th. So not like that, that far from our offices. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's a 15, 20 minute walk. Tops. Uh. It's a time capsule of a ridiculous era. Like, I feel like it sort of made sense in the 90s, but I walked into the bar and it just felt like, what is this place? Just very, I, I thought it was odd. 
architecture wise, that kind of thing? Just old. Just 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 old and just old and odd. So isn't it isn't it weird how nineties as a theme or whatever it does feel a little stale now? Well, it is. It's a long time ago. What's up, Cubs? Uh, That's where you working. Get out. <laughs> yeah, he just asked, "Where are you working? Where are you working?" <laughs> Close the door, please. So we are in the Catskills, in the family cabin. That, excuse me, my wife, Robin. You know better. Kobe, Kobe sucks. Get out of here. My wife's trying to sneak a peek in here. Um. So my stepdad bought this place in 1998, maybe. So I've been coming up here my whole life. It's a hunting cabin. My stepdad's a hunter. And it is, it's not glamorous. Let's just put it that way. It's... Okay. I think when you say hunting cabin, that, that paints a picture for yeah. me, usually. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to, you know, it's exactly what, you don't want to be walking around here barefoot, put it, you know? Okay. And you're not a hunter, though. I'm not a hunter. I... I did go hunting when I was younger. Uh, didn't enjoy it. I'm an animal lover, you know. And the, the family put you off in the corner to record this podcast. I did. I did shoot. I did shoot a turkey one time. Okay. Didn't feel great about it. I don't know. I we have deer that come up in our backyard. We have like a wooded area behind our house, and we see deer all the time. And yeah. I just think, like, I can't imagine going off into the woods somewhere. You, obviously, the reason you do it is is because you're getting away and getting outside and stuff. I suppose, but. The deer come right up to our backyard. It seems too easy for me almost. Right? You should, you should, play, you should tackle it. Yeah. All right. We Wait, talked about Kevin's... Before, before, before we get into the proper show, uh, this, is, this is an odd week, the last week of the year. Right? It's basically it's a, a week-long holiday. It's a week, it's a week where really nobody works, but people, so, you know... It's an unofficial. I honestly holiday. don't know why. Someone asked me, like, what's the market going to do the rest of the, week, the last week of the year? I don't know why the market's even open. Don't you think the market should just close between Christmas and New Year's every year? What's the point? Yeah, I don't know. It does. I mean, I, people shut down heading into Christmas. You know, I, I it, this sounds idiotic, and it is. It didn't even occur to me. Like, I, I, I hadn't spent much time thinking about what I'm going to be doing this week, and so on Saturday, I was like, "Wait, holy shit! What are we doing all week?" Uh, and my wife's like. Yeah, what do you mean? What are we doing? I told you this. What are we doing? I said, we should, let's go to Florida. She's like, we can't go to Florida. What are you talking about? <laughs> we were just going to go to Florida. But anyway, I checked. I was like, yeah, let's just go to Florida. I, I looked at prices for uh, airfare. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad. Okay, I, was I mean, the weather about... stinks, but the weather wasn't that bad. I mean, the, the prices weren't that bad. I've, I, are we I back? Track, I track the prices for spring break because we have a family of five to fly. It's not cheap. And last year, the prices were going up and up and up and up. And we had to pay a lot of money for our spring break, break tickets. And I've been looking, and they're just going down and down and down. And I'm, I'm still waiting because plane, I keep seeing plane tickets fall faster and faster, even for spring break, which is a peak time and usually one of the worst times to get tickets. When's your spring break? Mine's April. First week of April. Okay. I, I think this, this stuff of things that people pay, like especially gas prices and – Airfare and I don't know if restaurant food's ever going to fall, but stuff like that that people that's tangible to them and makes you know like oh I think that's going to be the green shoots for us is people getting the vibes back. So wait, one last thing, one last thing. How come spring break isn't universal? Like why is it regional? How come your spring break doesn't align with my spring break? Because if everyone had it the same week, the whole world would shut down. Fair, but here's a counterpoint. It's so like college I've, is a little earlier, high school is a little later. It's staggered. I get that. But do you do you all in the Midwest have off pre for President's Week in February? We now, yeah, it's like a midwinter break. Okay. So they get like Friday and Monday off. But that's turned into a mini spring break now. We're going on a trip for that one too. Hmm. Mid mid fall break, mid winter break. So many breaks. Our kids had three half days last week for That's absurd. Come on. Isn't it like yeah. they go to? It's like so they can check a day to say that they did it. I gotta be honest. My it's it's only been how long we've we been recording for? Nine minutes. My my arm is getting tired. For those of you who are listening, I'm using my arm as a mic stand. I, I you're gonna have to power through. On to the show. All right. Inflation is over at least for now. Core PCE, which is what the Fed pays attention to. 
It's PCE, less food and energy, which really makes people mad, but this is taking out the more volatile components. Annual rate of 1.87 over the past six months, according to Renaissance Macro. That's... Wow. It's Fed target. It's here. Now, the, the only other way you can say we can't declare victory yet is you've seen this chart. A bunch of people sent us this one, and I've seen this going around for a couple weeks or months now. This is from Apollo. They show CPI in the U.S. now on, on a different scale versus the 1970s, and it shows slow, 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 huge up, ramp, then back down. Wasn't this in Larry Summers' chart crime? Yeah, this. so, yeah, the, and you can see the, the axes are way off. They, there's some form fitting here. But the idea is, well, I don't know. And I think the, people, the thing people forget is the reason that it fell back then is because the 1973-74 recession slash market crash caused inflation to fall. And that was a nasty recession, and the stock market crashed 50%. It's a great point that people who are th floating this chart on conveniently leave out. So Mike Konzal posted this, and he said there was two stories for how to get disinflation, a reopening supply-side story like the 1940s and 1950s or the 1970s and early 1980s. And he's showing, he's, he has this chart that shows unemployment on one side and the change in year-over-year -year headline PCE growth on the other side. And 2023 is falling in the 1950 to 19, late 1950s, early 1950s, late 1940s camp of this is more like the World War II thing. Obviously, this is the other reason that this stuff is so hard to predict because we literally have two examples of inflation <laughs> over the past, you know, 70 what, years. Th this one and the last one? Yeah, it's like <laughs> there, there, there's two. The sample size is a little small, but his point was like, yeah, maybe the post-World War II stuff made more sense if you're going to do these kind of analogies than the 1970s. And that makes sense to me too. It was a wartime spending kind of deal and supply chains got screwed up and that makes way more sense to me than, oh, it's going to reaccelerate like the 70s. This feels like getting too cute, but could there be a scenario where disinflation lights the match for more inflation? What if prices start coming down, people start feeling better, stocks start going up, home prices start going up, and people just start, there's a spending boom. Would that cause inflation? But didn't we already have the spending boom? And didn't, like, the supply chain stuff is better now? I don't know. Are, are eventually people going to be tapped out enough? Or, you, or is it just people go into a bunch of debt and that's, and they don't want to stop? I don't know. I'm just trying to think of what could cause that's, another that's inflationary. Possible. I don't know. Goldman seems to think the same thing. They put out a report that was circulating. Uh, could inflation fall below 2%? And they basically said, uh, yeah, it could. It, it certainly seems that way. Here's another thing for the my green shoots I'm talking about. Car dealership guy tweeted the best 0% APR car deals right now. And there's all these different ones. The uh, What's a Subaru Soterra? That's an electric one. Ford Edge, Nissan Titan, Hyundai Santa Fe, all these Ford Explorer, Ford Expedition, all these Nissans ha are giving deals with 0% financing, which seems, I don't know how they, they do that in today's interest rate world, but... It's happening. And I, think, I think I might be trending. I think I think a, sub, a suburban or whatever those big trucks are might be in my future. You're gonna yes, get one. Yesterday, when we were driving up here, um, we put the third row up. We put Kobe and my dog in the third row. Logan's in the second row. My cooler's in the second row with like the seats down, and I couldn't. There was absolutely no more room for anything in the car to the point where we have a giant, like th there's a, a shopping bag in between Robin and I, I'm just like elbowing the shopping bag, like, get out of here. It was, it was no more room. Too much stuff for our kids these days. That's the thing. Do you think our parents would have ever packed a cooler when we were younger for anything? Absolutely not. All right. That's fine. If you want to get one, but I will judge you. That's all I'm saying. No, I don't want to get one. I'm going to judge myself. I don't want to get one. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I don't, I, I just don't know how much longer we could fight it. It's a lot of stuff with kids. All right, so someone someone sent us. There's oh, a wait, one last thing. My wife wants a second dog. Yeah, where's really? that going? Is that to make the pain of your first dog easier? The transition? Yes, yes. It's okay. too it's too painful to even discuss. I but, can't. But can't what even is go there. what is a better way to do it? Do it before the dog dies or after? I don't know. I'm I'm distraught even thinking about it. But but I said to her, we this where's it going on your lap? <laughs> That is true. Traveling with traveling with dogs is tough. It's, plus, 
Do you remember how hard it is to train a dog? It's like having a kid again. Well, I, I was at the vet. Last time I was at the vet, I saw a, a, a puppy and it brought back all those memories of, oh my God, it's a baby. You have to take it for shots and this and that, and I'm not ready for that. It's too much. It is a lot. Okay, so someone actually sent us. Last week I said, why is the equal weight S&P 500 ticker RSP? It should be EQL. Someone sent us a... I worked at Invesco when they bought Guggenheim's ETF lineup, uh, which is where RSP came from. It stands for Rydex S&P. Okay. All right, so. That was, I think that was before you had to, to get too cute with your ETF names. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't think that far ahead. They didn't think it was going to get this big. Yeah. Ben, you know what's kind of wild? We, uh, we, some, we spent so much time talking about tech stocks, rightfully so. Th- over the last three years, the NASDAQ and the S&P, I would clap and do the identical thing from... Uh, my cousin Vinny, but I can't clap because I'm holding this mic stand. But yeah, identical. That was a Marissa Tomei. Yeah. No, no, no. It okay. wasn't Marissa Tomei. It was the it was the it was the jerk coach from Mighty Ducks. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I gotcha. So both up 35 percent roughly in the last. What did you say? Three years. Three years. Okay. Not bad. A little bit surprising. You would think that tech it stocks is. have torched the S and P. Not necessarily the case. Another surprising fact about tech stocks and the S and P. Amazon over the last five years barely beat the S&P 500. Isn't that wild? Five years is not a short period of time. And Amazon, the, the, the wonderful, the gigantic, the disruptor. And Amazon, remember how badly they outperformed during the uh, sort of the pandemic? Because everyone thought, okay, everyone's buying everything on Amazon. You said how badly they outperformed? How much they outperformed? Yeah. Or- I guess, yes. I, yeah, I misworded that one. But- okay. Yeah. That, that bad meaning good. You know, I was talking Sorry, about this. I'm still a little foggy this, from Christmas. That's okay. I think I was talking about this on, on the compound and friends with Josh. We were talking, we were talking with Dan Nathan and he brought up like index funds and uh, how they're impacting the markets. And there's, there's, it's hard to argue that impact that index funds and the flows are having zero impact on the market, right? There's just so much money. How could they not be? Um, but this notion, now I don't know to the extent, I don't know what impact they're having, but this notion that like they're propping the market up or distorting prices or this or that, like, do we forget that Amazon fell 56%? Do we forget that? Did, did people stop investing in index funds in 2022? No. Apple had two separate 30% crashes in the last three or four years. Facebook, the fifth biggest stock at the time fell 70%. NVIDIA was down 70% last year. All the biggest names in the index. So I don't want to hear that, that argument anymore. Yeah, if you want to give me a propping up argument, it's the fact that everyone out of every paycheck, you know, 60% of the people are putting money into a 401k and a target date fund and they're rebalancing and they're constantly putting money in. That's, yeah, that, that would be that, the thing. That, that has to be impacting the market. And that's, not, I don't even think that, that I, you can't say that's propping up the market. I would say that is propping up valuations. Valuations should be higher in a world where people are just continuously buying stocks. That may, that argument makes more sense to me than valuations than also up the fund. should be higher in a in a world of relatively economic stability. We have a chart yes. later in the show, but all right, we're, we're getting, off, getting off track. This is pretty impressive. There was a story the other week in Bloomberg about ETF U.S. market share, and there's two titans here. There's King Kong and Godzilla, and I don't know which one is which. Who do you root for in that scenario? Because my son watched King Kong versus Godzilla. All right, this is this black and white. This is black and white. This is black and white. Go ahead. Yeah, it's King Kong, right? It's King Kong, of course. Yeah, yeah. who okay. roots for a lizard? I'm, I'm, to I'm tell just... you what, tell you what, if your kid roots for the lizard, you've you have you've got problems. You will have problems. That's true. I am a little worried that my son just really roots for people to like get their heads chopped off and killed in movies. Now he's like, go to the part where they start killing people. So I might have a serial killer on my hands. I don't know. But that, that part worries me a little bit. Dude, the bit. Godzilla movies are awful. Um, we threw on Godzilla King of, King of Monsters. Or there was a Godzilla versus Mothra and the, the three-headed dragon. Yeah, we watched that one too. Not oh, great. Unwatchable. Yeah, Oof. I agree. Oof. I didn't realize this I, was like a series. It's the same people from movie to movie. Oof. Coach, and I, Coach from Friday Night Lights, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I keep talking about Godzilla Minus One and the fact that it was made with a $15 million budget puts us to shame. Okay. How much are we spending on these pieces of shit movies? They're awful. I'll wait for that one to come out on streaming. The, the, I keep the, the streaming stuff is coming faster and faster where it goes from theater to streaming. I was going to rent The Holdovers the other day, the new Paul Giamatti one, yeah. the Alexander Payne movie. 
and it's coming on Peacock in like three days. I'm just going to wait. You know, I've got a bone to pick with Peacock. Okay. Every month I get an email uh, that your PayPal has authorized a payment to Peacock. Now it's $4.99, so it's not too big of a deal. I can't get into Peacock. I can't log in. I can't reset my password. It's on my TV because I think it's, I think Robin has somebody else's account, but it's nonsense. You sound like my parents right now. I literally, I, they, it's every time I start trying to reset my password, it says uh, unable to process this request. Do it on the, do it online, not on your TV. I did it online. All right. You sound like a boomer right now. <laughs> you sound like a boomer. You're saying online. <laughs> <laughs> www.peacock backslash uh so back to the titan thing blackrock versus vanguard oh, okay yeah is the king kong versus godzilla yeah so anyway so there. so blackrock was just completely dominant at the turn of the gfc it had 50 percent market share and vanguard I don't know when vanguard launched their first etf but vanguard was was they're way late to the game miles behind and those lines have converged and Vanguard's going to pass BlackRock. Now, I think the story is fairly straightforward because they're commodity products, right? They're low-cost index-based ETFs, probably have the same price for most of them or, you know, four basis points, three basis points. What really is the difference? None. Right. Uh, it's branding. Advisors are using Vanguard over BlackRock, all us equal, for... For Vanguard reasons. still has a huge DIY uh, market share too. That's true, but but I would suspect that the flows primarily predominantly are coming from yes advisors. I agree. That that's more money. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, okay, Duncan right, said here, I have to mention the the fact that there's construction going on behind me. I can't I hear was, it. Okay, not too Duncan, bad. Duncan's I, got hawk ears. The, oh, the hawks flooding, have, flooding hawks have around. Sight. What what have the best ears? Oh, African hunting dogs. Those those dogs have great ears. I know that because I went. I was at the Bronx. I was at the Bronx Zoo over the weekend, and I was taken by the size of their ears. And you're staying at a hunting cabin. That that too. Um, there was flooding in my building, and I'm literally the only office that didn't get put out. And everyone else has been out of their office for two or three months, and they're fixing all the offices around. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Remember we had this whole thing on the show about how much water could fit into a bathtub because there was flooding in your office. That wasn't that like two, was that like two years ago. That was a different flooding. But same office, right? Yes, same complex. Okay. Two floods in two years, yes. And I'm mm. unscathed. Here's, all right, another interesting thing about like the index fund, who sets prices, well, we know it's active managers. Here we go. Great chart, not a good chart, a great chart from Bank of America. Uh, it's showing the active share ratio of core managers versus the S&P 500. And the line goes up, the line goes down. And when it's going up, Active managers are deviating from their benchmark. You know, they're really, they're really going for it. And when the chart is going down, they're getting closer to the benchmark. And the they're they're more closely in line to the benchmark than they have been in the last decade. And I don't know, I don't really blame them. It's interesting. It looks to be like they hug the benchmark more when there's a bear market. Is that fair or not? Because 09 was the highest benchmark hugging that's like listen if we're all gonna we're all gonna go down let's go down together i don't know uh, no i don't know that you could make that blanket statement but it, but it is interesting that they're they're owning the index of course closet, closet index that's always been a thing yeah. that's that's why the owning index funds thing never bothered me because people were essentially owning index funds before through a mutual fund with higher fees and worse tax advantages yeah Great chart from Gina Martin Adams from Bloomberg. She said, earnings breadth, which is a percent of S&P 500 with earnings growth, hit a cycle low in 2023, but broke back above 60% with the third quarter earnings season, creating a cycle breadth bottom that likely enables equity market recovery. I think this is feather in the cap for the S&P 493. You lost me. Is this saying that there's a lot of companies that are Improving their earnings? Yes. Okay, that works. That's exactly right. Okay. All right, from the inbox. Good one here. Michael and Ben are so optimistic, it makes me nervous. I feel like I'm always optimistic, but fair point. This past month has been so good, it can't be real. Market goes up and gas goes down every day. The VIX is at 12. Life and investing is not this easy. 
Help us explore the potential downsides. Do you see consumer credit risk after the holiday bill is coming due? My wife and I are 43 and entering our peak earning years. Is it selfish to want the market to chill the F out so we can buy in? We are at a point where we can really accumulate shares, but everything is going up faster than our paychecks arrive. How do you talk to clients that feel they are putting significant money into play in a market that seems very expensive? All fair points, I think, here. There's no dooming. This is That's true. If you're entering your peak earning yields, you we've been saying this forever. You want the market to go down. But I don't think that investing has been easy. It feels easy the last three months, but we just went through one of the worst years ever in 2022. It was the third worst year ever for a 60-40 portfolio, the worst year ever for the bond market. It was like the seventh worst year ever for the stock market. The, 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 my least favorite saying in investing is the easy money has been made. It was hard making money these past couple of years. Really hard. And think about 2023 coming into the year. 100% consensus that we were going to have a recession. And then we had the regional bank crisis blow up. And then we had the, the usual stuff with the debt ceiling nonsense. And even through October, the equal weight index was down 5% of the year. The SP was only up 7%. And so, yeah, the last 60 days have been inc- an incredible run. Uh, this feels like projection, though. No offense to the emailer. Are we that optimistic? Or Maybe is this person the under. I think oh, is this person been, underinvested and he's projecting on us? We've, we've been celebrating a little bit how, th- how we made it through things, but I think that's just like a more of a relief than anything. Listen, if you're worried markets are expensive, I've been saying for a long time, buy value stocks, buy small caps, buy international stocks, buy high quality, buy dividend, whatever. All that stuff is way, way cheaper than tech stocks. If you're thinking the NASDAQ 100 is expensive, sure, I'll agree with you, but everything else is, is not expensive by any means. Ben, you know this the person rest needs, of the market. You know what this person needs? They need to read an old post of yours. Do you know which one they need to read? The Bob one? The Bob one. Ben wrote a post about Bob, the world's worst market timer. And all Bob did was top tick stocks throughout his entire career. He put money in when the market was at an all-time high before major drops. And how did Bob end up, Ben? Way better than expected. Still my most popular blog post. As it should be, it's the power of long-term focus, not getting distracted by the noise. Potential downsides always exist. That's why stocks go up. We don't even need to go through them because I feel like everyone knows them. But I I agree. This person is right to think that I should want stocks to go nowhere for a while so I can buy them at lower prices. Absolutely. But I hope you've been buying. I hope you were buying for the last 18 months when stocks were down, though. I hope you kept buying. Yeah, selfishly, as somebody who's who's investing every, every two weeks, you want the market to go nowhere, right? Like, just let me accumulate as much as possible. That's that's the the right mindset. But then you can't have that mindset and then also be scared when the market falls. Like, it's either a gift or it's not. And I view it as a gift every time it happens. Yeah. I I don't think coming back from a bear market that was really nasty, I don't think that should make you... Obviously, the, the downsides we know. There could be a recession. There could be... Yeah, what about the upsides? What about the risks to the upside? That's the thing. Nobody no one ever, ever says, th- here's what could go right. That. Yeah. This one surprised me. We put this in the compound. We had 4,000 votes almost. What do you think will perform best in 2024? Now it's one year. We did Bitcoin, gold, the NASDAQ, S&P, or treasuries. Bitcoin won with more than one third of the vote. The S&P was next, then the NASDAQ, then treasuries and gold. So 34% of people said Bitcoin would be the best performer. Hmm. This surprised me, especially from our audience, which isn't like a bunch of crypto crazies. I think- Yeah, I want, I would, Duncan, can you, next time we, next, this show, next show, whatever, can you put a vote in the same thing as this? Do you own Bitcoin? What do you, oh, what percentage of our audience do you think owns Bitcoin? What? Is I'm it around s- a third? I would say 40%. So that's crazy The high. thing is, I do think crypto is on like any, any asset class there is in terms of the FOMO is way, way worse when things are going up. And the dread is 10 times worse when it's going down. I think the FOMO is so palpable because we've seen parabolic moves in the past. You know, you're, you know your stocks aren't going to double in a year. And there's nothing that's tying Bitcoin to fundamentals so that it can't, like why, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing stopping Bitcoin from going to 100,000, 150,000. And so just that thought in people's minds, it does weird things to your brain. Yes. There's more chasing involved and more dunking involved in crypto than any other asset class. Yeah. Fast money just wrecks our emotional stability, like financially. 
Yes. Uh, all right. Hey, another email. Hey, guys, I absolutely love the show. Really appreciate all the content you put out. Oh, this is a good one. I was listening to today's show and want to fully endorse what you said about investor engagement following the meme stock craze. So last week, for those who missed the show, we were talking about like how more, more people own stocks than ever. And Ben and I were wondering, hey, maybe the Robinhood thing, the, the crazy stuff was actually good because it got people in the market and it got people to understand that the casino style of investing is not the right way. And so anyway, yeah. back whatever to the drew them in, it made, yeah. they stuck around. So um, I want to fully endorse what you said about investor engagement following the meme stock craze. I finished medical school in the spring of 2020 and started my residency and got caught up in the Reddit Robin and whirlwind. I made like $10 on a couple of option calls and lost a couple hundred on crypto and bad stock picks. Then in the spring of 2021, someone mysteriously sent me a copy of the psychology of money. Shout out to Morgan. Um, I absolutely loved the book. And not long after I got hooked on your podcast since then, I've gotten big on the Boglehead philosophy and other responsible investing practices. Needless to say, I learned my lesson quickly and all things considered relatively painlessly. TLDR, I'm glad I made these mistakes early in my career and with relatively little money, it set me up for a much better future. How about that? Paying the market tuition, right? Yeah, not everyone becomes a crazy gambler because they make a few option bets. That's pretty good. How about that? So uh, an another listener emailed this guy. This guy wrote a post about leveraged ETFs. I think we were talking about like the, there's a four times one coming out. Yes. Q, Q, right? Q, Q. Oh, the, the quad Qs. Oh, no, no. Sorry. It's X, 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 X. Okay. Duncan wants the, the quad Q. So these are, we, we've spoken like just a billion times, even with direction. Uh, Ed has said like as, as uh, emphatically as he can, that these are trading vehicles, but somehow. Yes. There's are still always new investors that have to learn the lesson the hard way. So this person did wrote a post and he said he showed the performance over a four month period. And these are real world examples. So there was an index that gained 2% over a four month period. The 2X ETF lost 6%. The 2X inverse ETF lost 25%. Example number two, where the index gained 8%. The 3X ETF lost 53%. And the 3X inverse ETF lost 90%. Whoa. Point so the is, volatility just crushing you. The volatility crushes you. It is not linear. If something's up 30% over a year, you're not going to be up 60% in a 2X or 90% in a 3X. It just doesn't work that way. So people that are emailing us, well, I have the, I have the risk tolerance. It's not what you think it is. Th these products are not meant to be bought and held. They're just, they're just not. Right. Even if the returns can be good in certain years, there are periods where you could get crushed in these like things. Like if you, if you really want to use leverage, just use longer dated options. These are not the vehicles for that. That's fair. All right. Last year, a recession or this year really was consensus. So this chart was going around. This is from Financial Times. It was published last year and they pulled these people in 2022. 85% of economists pred predicted a recession in 2023. It really was about as consensus as you could get. This other chart from Charter looked for Google searches for U.S. recession. Now look at 2008, huge spike. 2020, huge spike. 2022 was bigger than both of those. Not even close. So it, it really, really was. Yeah, Jenny so getting Yellen back to our point about like this year, if, if we do sound optimistic, fine. Okay, guilty. We've been through a lot. Right. We should celebrate. It doesn't mean you spike the football and you ignore risk and you go all in, but we've yeah. been through shit. Like <laughs> it's okay to be, to celebrate a little bit. Yeah. So my, my favorite stat since 2010, the U S economy has been in a recession 1% of the time since 2010, we've been in a recession for two months. And how many of those months, how many of the, that time, how much of that 99% of the time were people predicting a recession? Most of it probably. Remember double dip recessions after the financial yeah. crisis were a thing? Yeah. Then in 2011, we had the European crisis that like the euro was going under and the European Union is done. 2018, people thought we might be going into recession because there was a bear but I, market. I think, I think it's, it's, it's like, it's rational irrationality to be always worried about a bear market because they're so damaging and devastating, not even just psychologically. Like if you get a 55% bear market, that means that years of gains are wiped out. Right. So even think, though people- I think the 2008 people, crisis brought us back to 1996 the 90s. or something. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So 
it's it's how we're wired to be to be looking out for things like this because they really are. They're not just like, oh, no big deal, 20%. Yeah, 20%, no big deal. The big ones are a, a, a big deal. So you you mentioned the recession piece that we, th- this one was flying around too. The U.S. has gone through 34 recessions since 1957. This is a great chart. We both talked about this before too. Pink lines are recession. Blue lines are expansion. And you can see pre- Great Depression, more or less. From the Great Depression before, the 1930s and before, there was recessions all the time. And now they are way fewer and far between. It just doesn't happen. I think the number I looked at it, I don't know, we had one every three years or something in the past. And now it just doesn't happen very often. I think there's, there's a few reasons. One of them is just that the U.S. economy, we used to be an emerging market, more or less. We we're on the gold standard, which is way less flexible than our current system. I know people say, oh, printing money. Yeah, sure. Of course the U.S. didn't go into recession. We printed trillions of dollars. Guess what? That's worth it to me. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happy to take that trade off. We didn't go into recession. I don't care. We printed trillions of dollars to make it happen. That's a good thing. Yeah, but our grandkids. Yeah. Guess what? They're going to have, they're going to print a lot of money too. But, but I, thought, I thought economic stability was supposed to lead to instability. <laughs> that is true. The other thing is the, the creation of the Fed helped a lot here. So it's a lot of different things, but I, again, I think that I take this as good news. Ben, you said, I don't know if you slack this or, or whatever. You said, I swear the comment section is getting nicer lately. Vibes are back. I can't, I, go ahead. Are, are the comments nice? Really? I sent you a few. There was some, someone in one of the comments said, this is Michael's best show ever. Or, Michael was on it, on it today or something. Uh, Watch, you're going to get killed in the comments this week. But <laughs> no, no, but I, I, I said a lot of people in the comments are good. I said the vibes are back. People are being nice, and the comments section is— What if it's just is, seasonal? What if it's seasonal? People are feeling, you know, it's Christmas time. It, it could be, but I, yeah. I, I still read the YouTube comments. I don't, you don't do it. You know why? I'm perfectly thrilled to be in a place in my life where we have a comment section. Speaking of Christmas, I was— I heard the word like Secret Santa or whatever. And I, I don't know why it brought me back to uh, 2011. 2011. So last week, this all this all tied to like my comment last week about how I how I felt rich five years ago, just having just not having to worry about money, like really truly worried to the point that my eye was twitching. To me, that I was equating like comfortable and rich is the same thing to me. And how I'm grateful to have a comment section. In 2011, I was at a secret Santa party. Here was my, with, with, my, with my coworkers. I, I don't know if I ever told this story, but I probably told this to you. I was a temp at Citibank. My aunt got me a job there, which I was thrilled to have because I was unemployed. You know what I was doing? You know the, like, employee training videos of, like, uh just how to behave in the workplace, whatever. Sexual harassment. Just all of that sort of stuff. I was watching those videos and making sure, I had like a checklist to make sure that the videos actually contained the information that the company wanted them to have. And I was at a secret Santa party with like the people in that group. Kind of seems like AI takes that job over now, right? Uh, Totally. But it was just, it was just, what am I what am I, what am I actually doing? How is this my life? And now I've got people in the comment section watching our YouTube show. So it's all great. I am beyond grateful that people are watching our, our show, but that being said, and people could dunk, it's, it's fine, but I don't need to say it. Right. I don't want to see people Fair. being mean. I don't so see my, be, my being summary, mean. my summary of you saying, I feel richer than ever last week is the Nick Murray comment. My favorite quote from Nick Murray is if you're still worried, you aren't wealthy. And he, he says, that's true for any amount of money you have. So regardless of how what your net worth is, your portfolio, if you aren't worried that much about money, you're wealthy. Yeah, I, so I love that take. Yeah, it's, that, that's how I feel. I think uh, anybody would objectively have seen my bank account or my assets and be like, you, dude, you're not, you're not rich. Because we know people <laughs> with multiple, multiple millions of dollars who are worried all the time. And I don't think you can, you can look at that as a rich life. I'm pretty if positive. You, if, if you care about money that much. Yeah, I'm pretty positive that if you never struggle to make money, you feel a lot differently about it. So I can't imagine, True, I can't imagine uh, having millions of dollars and not feeling financially secure for myself personally. I understand how people get there, but not for me. Uh, I'm built different. 
All right. Uh, J- Joe Weisenthal had uh, tweeted a chart about how Square now has a payroll index growth tracker. And this was the big worry coming into 2023, Legit- a legitimate worry that we really, we couldn't know until we found out, where it was average hourly earnings, the wage, the wage spiral, right? Which always seems funny to me that people were worried wages were going to grow too fast. I get the economic reasoning behind that worry, but it's always funny to me, like, geez, we can't have people making more money. That's going to be awful. Yeah, but you understand. Yes. Anyway, th- that I mean, is is it's hard to like say this is this is the one out of all the components, but this is a big one. And uh, average hourly earnings, the growth is going in the right direction, which is which is down. And anecdotally, you don't hear as many of the crazy stories about the fast food places with huge signs saying we need $25 workers or whatever. That, that stuff seems to have abated. Yeah. Why does Square have economic data now? Everyone does? Um, do they do payroll stuff? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it's payments, so I don't know. All right. Moving on. Uh, crypto. Matt Hogan tweeted... These new S&P stable report, stablecoin reports are pretty good, to be honest. Crypto won't love the down rating of Tether and DAI, but if you read through the actual reports and view it from a U.S.-based institutional perspective, the, anal- the analysis is reasonable. Here's the point. The, regardless, it's great to see mainstream research increasing. Another sign we're entering the mainstream era of crypto, the mainstreaming of crypto continues. So I was thinking about how people often say Bitcoin doesn't do anything. Which is, I guess, which is fair. Like, I use Venmo. What do I need? I don't need Bitcoin for what I don't use it. What's the use case? Show me the use case. You know what it does? It works. And maybe that's enough. Like, it does exactly what it said it was going to do. The network never goes down. As far as I know, payments work. It works. Right. You could do it to transfer a bunch of stuff, but people just don't do that because they don't want to. But it works. That's what it does. It works. And maybe so, that's all it does, and maybe that's enough. I'm not throwing shade at Matt here. here two things that I've never typed in my life, TBH and IMO. I just, I can't do it. I feel <laughs> like, <laughs> you know the, the, the Leo meme where he's kind of sipping on whatever, and he's looking all high and mighty? I, I, I feel Wait, which is that's the meme? I, The Leo from Django where he's kind of all dressed up fancy, uh, and he's, yeah. that's how I would feel if I tweeted, or if I wrote TBH or IMO. Kind of like, I don't know. It, it's just personal preference. I just can't do it. I hear what you're saying. I find I find neither of them to be, and you're too sensitive. I am. I I don't. I still don't use emojis. I I just. How I can't. do you live? I don't know. I can't do it. Occasionally, I'll, like a thumbs up or something. I, I can't do it. I just don't do emojis. I think I was. It just it missed me. So you but I, but, but you're comfortable saying ha 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 ha. Yeah, I'll go, LOL, I'll use. Sure. All right. Activity is coming back. Redfin has seen double-digit annual increase in the in homeowners contacting real estate agents for selling their homes this week. New sale listings up 9% from a year ago, the biggest annual increase since July 2021. The uptick is partly due to falling rates, with homeowners feeling less locked in by rates in the 3 to 4% range. It's happening. Activity certainly bottomed in the real estate market, I think. I'm not saying it's going to come screaming higher. It could, but it's... That re- I think the housing recession is over. Oh, no, it will come it. screaming higher. Activity is going to explode. If interest rates stabilize in the 6% range or whatever, their uh, activity is going to explode. Someone sent, Joe Cassandra sent me this tweet. I, was, I wrote something about housing last week. He said, I brought a primary house two weeks ago for a family of six during the worst time to buy a house. Our mortgage payment tripled, ouch, and the rate is above 8% LOL. Also sent out 4,000 letters to find a house. Ended up being a waste of time. Ask me anything. Guy literally top tech mortgage markets, mortgage rates. I asked him when he's when he's gonna refinance. I, at that, this point, do you wait to five percent? Refinancing is a pain in the ass. I mean, it obviously is. worth it, but it should be easier. Especially, actually, I refinanced probably a year or two after I bought my house, and I couldn't believe all the hoops that I had to jump through. I'm like, you just saw all of this. Why are you asking me for my wife's inf- work information in 20- We did complain a lot about it. Yeah. My whole really thing annoying. 
if I got my, my original mortgage with you, you already got that information, right? I should be able to just prove that a lot of it hasn't changed. I think yes. I, re I refinanced twice during the pandemic. I think I did twice within a 12 month period. Uh, ben, somebody sent us this kind of wild. There's free land in the Midwest. Do you know, do you, have you heard about this? No, explain no, it. No, this me. is rural. They're not even towns. I mean, the population for these places. So, he, so I just screenshotted like the rural, the towns in Kansas where you can get free land. Population, 1,300, 680, 900, 1,300, 1,900, 700. I think this is actually the plot from Far and Away with Tom Cruise and Cole Kidman. Remember where you just put a flag down? Dude, it's a great movie. I don't know why. What year was that? I, I'm positive. I'm positive. I saw that in the theater. I remember the boxing scene. Was that in the beginning? That's towards the end. But yeah, he's, the end? He, he's, he's a bare knuckle boxer, yes. What, what year was that? What, what was my dad thinking? Why did I see early that to, movie? Early to mid 90s. Dude, I was seven years old. Why did I go to that movie? That's a good, our, kids are, our kids are seven. Can you imagine taking your kid to see Far and Away? Yeah, that's true. People don't worry about that stuff as much back then. What the hell? A young man, here's the description. A young man leaves Ireland with his landlord's daughter after some trouble with their father and they dream of owning land at the big giveaway in Oklahoma. Yeah, I like that great movie. movie for a seven-year-old. <laughs> All right, I, Unbelievable. I guess. So sm anyway, small, but, but town, small towns trying to get people to come to them, is that the idea? But, okay, lots ranging from 12,000 to 36,000 square feet. Here are the requirements. You have to build a home within four and a half years. This sounds like a, this sounds kind of appealing for a certain person. Do you think it's hard to get water and electrical and all that stuff to these places though? Is that the rub? Or are they just, they just want people to come? I'm sure there's lots of rubs to being in a startup town, but I don't but, know. Okay. So if, you, if, you're, if you're worried about the cost of housing, this is sure. All right. Good one from the Wall Street Journal that was flying around this past week. The rise of forever renters. This one was a little surprising to me. The number of renters with personal income in 2022 compared with one, three, and five years earlier, more than a million is by far the fastest growing cohort. Okay? They still make up a small percentage of the overall market, but you see people's renters less than $50,000 is falling. Uh, more than 200K for income or more than a million is rising. The number of renters of rental households with incomes of more than a million reached record high of 4,453 in 2022. That is four times as many as in 2017. The number of renters earning $200,000 a year is up fourfold since 2010. I wonder how many of these are in California, New York. That's yeah. got to be a, like it, people in San yeah. Francisco. But the point was, some people have just decided they want the flexibility and it's actually cheaper in a lot of cases, especially in big markets, to rent a place rather than buy it in a spot. A lot of them they're showing these high-end apartment complexes, how much it would cost to buy versus rent, and you still get all the amenities. It's pretty good. It also says new subdivisions full of single-family homes for rent, all but non-existent a decade ago, are springing up from coast to coast. More rentals are advertising themselves as kid and pet friendly, permitting renters to make extensive modifications to their spaces. This is interesting. I, I, it's kind of a surprising trend. Hmm. Um, I do wonder if interest rates fall to the number of renters fall. Like these seems like this, th these, this seems like people that, that are wanted to be in a house, but are, but a lot of them said that they, they don't, they just decided buying's not for them. And you're right. Maybe it is the affordability thing. Yeah. Buying's back, not for them change. when interest rates are at 8%. I totally get it. That's fair. So they also had in this, in this story, home ownership rates around the world. So the U S is 64%. Brazil is over 70%. India is 87% and China is 89%. That those numbers I would not have expected. That's crazy high, right? Yes. I know people always worry about the Chinese real estate and housing market and stuff, and they must incentivize people to own land. But that's surprising how much how small the U.S. is comparatively, and it's hmm. relatively steady there too. Um. All right. So, bird, bird scooters. I don't know if they're disappearing or if it's like a restructuring, but they declare bankruptcy. Okay, we had some good time on those scooters. Great time on those scooters. They raised nine hundred sixteen million dollars. Wow. And they may be out of business. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. I the suppose. economics of that. I mean, we spoke about this last year, two years ago. The economics of those, that business does not work. Do you think just, they also underestimated the amount of people that would just crap on those scooters and 
just destroy them and push them over and throw them and such. Yeah. I'm guessing they lost so many scooters from drunk people leaving the bars. People threw them in rivers. People let them, let them on fire. <laughs> really? Just maintenance. I guess I that. Maintenance. A lot of maintenance. Oh. Survey of the week. This is, this is pretty... It's pretty bleak. They asked 12th graders. They asked 12th graders. This is not a new survey. Satisfaction with, quote, the way you get along with your parents and then with your life as a whole these days. It's, it goes back to 1976. And satisfied with your parents is going up and up and up. And satisfied with life as a whole is going down and down and down. Now, let's start with the first line. I don't know... My first reaction to this is an, uh, just a knee-jerk reaction. I don't know that you should be satisfied with your parents. Like, growing up, I don't know that I, I obviously, like, loved and respected my parents. But if I was in 11th grade, I don't know if I would have said, like, yeah, my parents are my best friends. Like, I feel like that's, like, a lot of parenting these days. And I don't know if that's good. My parents were my parents. They weren't my best friends. I can see this both ways as well. You're right. There's a lot of millennial parents who, the what's the line from Amy Poehler and in, in Mean Girls? I, I'm like the, I'm a cool mom. I'm not like the other moms where they yeah, try we, to be the best friends. We, is it is it is it good to have cool parents? I don't I don't know. I don't know that it's black or white that you could like paint with a broad brush, but I just don't know. Or the fact that parents just spend way more time with their children these days than they. I, there was a stat go, I, in one of the books I read. I summarized it. It's like the American dream is not dead. And the stat was something like stay-at-home mothers in the 1960s spent less time with their kids than working mothers do today. I, I see this both ways, as parents are way, way, way more involved in their kids' lives today. And that's a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Yeah, It really I, yeah. depends. Anyway, satisfied with life as a whole, this chart is just crashing, and it's uh, really a shame. And, you know, I think a lot of this is really okay. – I think a lot of so this, Derek is social me- this is social media. Derek Thompson had a piece on this, and this is not everyone, obviously, but have we, we've glamorized the idea of depression a little bit these days, which sounds like a weird thing to say, but it's almost like a, a crutch for some people. Mm. I don't know. Uh, that, somebody somebody emailed us last, this week, like commenting on the person who has millions of dollars but doesn't feel rich because they see big houses. Right. And the quote there is comparison is a thief of joy. Right. And I think that that's, that's what social media did to young people and young people just, it's hard for grownups to see other people and not be envious. 17 year olds just cannot, it's not good. It's really, really not good. I, agree. Um, I couldn't imagine going through high school with, I've always said, I, I'm so glad that we didn't have camera phones or social media when I went through college. And I feel like it has to change the way that you behave in a lot of ways because you're under a microscope. Yeah. If, if there was pictures available or videos of me at parties in college or something, I would, I would totally change my behavior. Maybe yeah. it would be in a good way in some, some ways, but uh, I, I'm just so glad I didn't have to live under that microscope all the time. All right. Here's, this, is, this is a bit fringe, but I don't think it's – I thought this was interesting enough to share. Talk about like sentiment scores that seem out of whack in the U.S. versus the rest of the world. Um, everyone's trying to pin the disconnect between the economy is great, but survey scores are in the toilet on social media or some other cause. Sure, those are plausible, but what if it is this? Tipping. Go on. He says, tipping culture has gotten out of control. The increase in the price you pay isn't captured in CPI because the tip doesn't count in the price reported. And if you don't tip, you are ashamed, so you either pay more than you expected or you feel like an asshole if you're not adding 20%. Given that tipping culture isn't as prevalent globally, could that explain the U.S. versus the world disconnect? Okay, the answer is definitely no. There's no way that tipping is the source of the disconnect. I give this person, but, I have respect for this person for coming up with this hot take, though. Great take. All credit to the take, because I do think that there's, the fact that CPI is, does not capture tipping, interesting. Very interesting. Good little nugget. The Good thing is, it's, it's people think you'll be shamed if you don't tip, but you can just say no or press no. You don't have to do it. You do. You feel obliged, but you don't have I to. I mean, but when somebody sp- spins around the the computer at you and you just say no tip, you you feel a little, you feel the sweat glands. I am. Percolating. I have found myself tipping more since the pandemic because I feel like service workers got a raw deal, and so I felt as I somebody who spent almost a decade in the service industry, 
living on tips, I, I tip well, not to brag. Good on you. Oh, so speaking of the why aren't millionaires happy thing, I have a solution for all the people who have a lot of money and aren't happy. The Family Man. Watch The Family Man with Nicolas Cage and Tay Leone. That'll solve all your problems. I never saw if it. You, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? You've never seen The Family Man? I never saw it. Okay. I rewatch it almost every year. I remember you mentioned going to the theater. I remember going to see this in the theater on Christmas Day in 2000 or whenever it came out. You've literally never seen this movie before? I've never seen that movie. It's, it's even a New York slash New Jersey movie. That's disappointing. Go see it. It's great. I mean, the, the moral of the story is if you marry Tay Leone, you'll be happy. It doesn't matter how much money you have, but the premise is amazing. Nicolas Cage is a wealthy uh, financier in New York, and he gets to go back and see the life he could have had if he would have just married his college sweetheart and not left her. Don Cheadle's in it. Amazing movie. One of the best Christmas movies of this century. Easily. And Nicolas wow. Cage is cooking. Okay. Ben, here's one that could um, have been. Oh, sorry. So here's another movie from the early 2000s. Ben Affleck, James Gandolfini, Catherine O'Hara, and Christina Applegate. Surviving Christmas. You heard of it? Never heard of it. James Gandolfini in a Christmas movie. This could have been a classic. And it, I rewatched it for the first time in, I don't know, 15 years. It's terrible. Just <laughs> bad. I mean, it felt like a CBS sitcom with like, it needed a laugh track. I don't know how it's so bad with that lineup of people. Are you, what, what do you, how do you feel about A Wonderful Life? It's my mom's favorite Christmas movie. She used to always okay. make me watch it. That being said. Yeah, it never really did it for me. It's, it's listen, it's, it's almost 100 years old. It's tough. It's a tough watch. I had a, girl, a girlfriend in high school who made me go see a theatrical version with her parents, first time I met her parents, of A Wonderful That's, Life. That's way was, too much. That was tough. Uh, congratulations on the Lions. And congratulations to me. I won a lot of money on them. I, I had to sweat it out, but we did it. We did it. Uh, First time in almost 30 years. They won their division. So season ticket holders in 2024 will see an average increase of 30% and as much as 85% for certain Ford field seats. All right. That's what happens. I'm okay that's with that as long as capitalism. you give us a discount when the team stinks. Yeah, that's never going to happen. That's what it should be, though. Um, oh, Ben, did your daughter win that game that you yelled at the rest of the stand defeated? Of course. My coaching. Yes. Um, I went to see a movie this week. I saw The Iron Claw. The oh, how was it? The Zac Efron 24 production of the Von Erich family. I remember Texas Tornado vaguely. I think it was like the early 90s. I think he did some stuff with Ultimate Warrior. See, I'd never heard of them, but I saw the preview and it looked really good. So it's not so much a wrestling movie as it is a family drama. Like the wrestling was sort of in the background. It's not like Rocky where like there's like a build up to the fights. You know what I mean? But I didn't. Now, I think that the audience is going to like it a lot more in general than I did. Now, I'm not sure if it's because I saw it on Friday night at 945, which is past my bedtime. And I also took, took an edible, which was not advised <laughs> because it's not really, it's not like a fun movie. It's, in fact, the opposite of fun. It's depressing, but it's also just a lot of dialogue. So I just, I just, I thought that it would have been. That was a Long Island hedge right there. I feel like you just say you didn't like the movie. I didn't love, no, it, how about this? It was, a, it was definitely a good movie that I didn't love. And I wonder okay. if, I wonder if it would have been better served in, as a six episode show. Because there's just a lot okay. of plots and subplots and relationships that they didn't get to go deep on because it was a two-hour movie. So I felt like I needed more. But, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, Ben. Did you watch Past Lives or not? I did not watch Past Lives. I want to. I okay, asked I've you got, for I've it. Got, I'm going to. I've got one more Christmas one that I rewatch almost every year now. And it's bizarre because I don't know why. The Family Stone. Have you ever seen this movie? No. It's almost a hate watch. The, the cast is amazing. I remember the first time I watched it, I absolutely hated it because the plot is so insane but it's Craig T. Nelson and Dan Keaton and Luke Wilson and Rachel McAdams and Claire Danes and it's a it's a Sarah Jessica Great Parker cast. it's an amazing cast and I just like the coming home for Christmas vibe of the movie 
And once you get over the plot holes, which are immense, I actually, it's, and a lot of the characters are unlikable. For some reason, I, I love rewatching it. I don't know why. It's a hate, hate rewatch. I want you to watch Saltburn and tell me what you think. Okay. You got it. You watch The Family Man. We'll call it uh, even. Watch The Family Man? Okay, I will watch The Family Man. Is Saltburn uh, on a streaming platform? Is what? Saltburn is on Amazon Prime. Okay. It's, uh... I have no idea what it's about. Okay. Better off. Just go in with a blank slate. All right. Okay. This, is, this is our last show of 2023. Much better year for most of us than 2022. Ben, we started the show in November 2017. 17. Wow, November 2017. Pretty remarkable when we started this thing. I remember the New Yorker had a, had a cartoon like literally two weeks before we launched it. And it was two people sitting down at a, at a, at a restaurant table and one of them said to the other, I'm thinking of stopping a podcast. Right. Cause that was all the rage. I'm, th- I'm starting a podcast and we were nervous. We were nervous doing this. We felt like imposers, uh, impo- imposters, posers. I just mixed two words, but here we are six years later, almost six years later. And Duncan tells us that we're now on, in some weeks, a top five investing podcast on Apple. So for people, for new listeners, thank you. But especially for the originals that have been with us from the beginning, just cannot say enough, cannot express enough gratitude. Even yes, people in the comment love- section that, that are not nice. I, I, I appreciate you as well. We, we love our audience. Everyone is great. The people who we come in contact with. I got run into with a gym the other day by some guy listening to our show in the gym. It was also, it was a very, I got to ask you about this. It was a very awkward encounter. What's the etiquette of taking out AirPods when you're having a conversation with someone? Do you ever take them out or not? Do I just, I just, I just feel like the polite thing to do is just to take one out. Okay. You know why? I because f- one stops the music. True. I don't have the etiquette for these things, but yes. Thank you to all the listeners. We really appreciate it. We love hearing from people. We have a great Personal audience. emails personal responses and next show i think michael's 2024 predictions Mm. all right see you then